Good morning. Good morning. My name is, how are you this morning? Good? Good. It's a beautiful day outside, isn't it? Uh, my name is Karen Bellaman, and I'd like to welcome you all today to Christ Presbyterian Church. The announcements for today. There will be a new member class starting in August 21st, 28th, and September 4th at the church at 7 p.m. If you are interested in becoming a member or would like more information, email or call the office and sign up or sign up at the information table. June, uh, Christ, Presbyterian, Christ Presbyterian women will not be meeting. Women's Summer Saturday Bible Study will start on June 29th. It will be, um, we'll be studying the book, Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers by Dane Ortland. It will be led by Beth Bayless. It's a 10 week study and it will be Saturday at 10.30 a.m. There's a sign-up sheet available out in the lobby, so if you have any questions or want more information, Julie Smith, you can contact her. The service for our lovely Linda Perkins will be held June 23rd at 1.30 p.m. at Cloverdale Funeral Home. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs> If you'd please rise for this morning's call to worship. And the kids are kind of coming in. Well, let's wait a second for the kids to sit down so they can join us. They are part of our worshiping community, too. And the red panda as well. <laughs> All right, if you'd please draw your attention to the screen behind me. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. Creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia, Thou burning sun with golden beam, Thou silver moon with softer beam, Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia. Thou rushing wind that art so strong, ye clouds that sail in heaven along, oh, praise him, alleluia. Thou rising morn when praise rejoice, ye lights in evening find a voice. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou flowing water, pure and clear, make music for thy Lord to hear. Alleluia, Alleluia. Thou fire so masterful. man both warmth and light oh praise him oh praise him alleluia 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 Lord, all ye men of tender heart forgiving others take your part oh sing ye Alleluia, ye who long pain and sorrow bear, praise God and on him cast your care, oh praise him, oh praise him, 
Please join me uh, on the screen behind me for a unison prayer of confession, followed by a time of silent confession. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have given us the law and Moses and the teachings of Jesus to direct us in the way of life. You offer us your Holy Spirit so that we can be born to new life as your children. Yet, O oh God, we confess the ways of death have a strong attraction and that we often succumb to their lore. Give us the vision and courage to choose and nurture life that we may receive your blessing. Amen. Friends in Christ, know that you are forgiven through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who is true with a capital T. Hear these words of assurance from Acts chapter 10, 43. All the prophets testify about Christ that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Thanks be to God. And Cable this morning is going to be our reader from Catechism. How did God create man? God created man, male and female, in his own image and in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness to rule over all of the creatures. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus said. Now rejoice, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. 
right, please be seated. All right, if you'd please join me uh, in a time of prayer. Let, let us pray. Lord, we come into your presence today and rejoice that you are the creator God who made heavens and earth. Uh, we echo the words of Karen this morning that it is a beautiful day. It is the day that you have indeed made and you have ordained for us to come into your presence and to worship you in spirit and truth. Lord, not only are you the creator God, but you are the God of redemption and you call a people to yourself and you redeem them through the work of your son and transform them through the spirit. Lord, as we continue to journey with you through your 10 words, the 10 commandments, allow us to see that the law condemns us before you, that Jesus saves us through the gospel, which we just sang about, and allow us as a congregation, Lord, to know that your spirit indwells us and you seek to transform us more and more into your son's image each and every day. May we see that the law stings, but at the same time, may we see that your spirit gives us life. Lord, you are a God who heals, and we pray for those in our church who need healing from medical conditions, through those who are grieving the loss of a loved one recently departed or departed long ago. We pray for children that are wayward, and I just ask, Lord, through your healing touch and through your presence, uh, that you heal those who have come through the door this morning. And I also pray that you would heal all the unspoken needs that we bring into this room as we worship you today as well. Lord, you are a God who calls your church to bear witness to your gospel. And you do this through the various courts of the church, which we'll engage with today. And I pray, Lord, that our session would continue to uphold the peace and purity of your, your calling upon her. I pray for the court of the Presbytery of the Pacific Northwest for peace and purity. And I also pray for our General Assembly as well, which will meet in eight days. As we turn our attention to General Assembly, praying this week and next week, I ask, Lord, that you would bless Dean Weaver, our stated clerk. I pray that you would bless the moderator for this year's General Assembly, Victor Jones. I pray for all the directors at the General Assembly Office, our church health director, our church planting director, and our world outreach director. May your spirit rest upon them and may you propel them forward to do the work to which you have called them. I ask, Lord, as I've been praying every day this month, that all the commissioners, as they get ready to travel to Memphis for the 2024 General Assembly, that they would arrive safely and that they would be governed by a gospel of peace, even when disagreement is dealt with, which we'll work through today in the sermon. So Lord, may you bless the General Assembly of the 2024. May you bless the work of the Presbytery, and may you also continually bless the work of the session which governs this church. Finally, we pray the words that the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord by giving him our tithes and offerings.
Let's stand and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, you are indeed the Good Shepherd, and you have sheep scattered throughout the whole entire world and various walks of life. I pray, Lord, that you would use this money uh, in response to your gospel, and you would call your sheep home to be with you, and may you watch over them faithfully. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Jim Vale, and the Old Testament reading today is from Deuteronomy. 19th chapter, 15th through 21st verses. I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Let us pray. Lord God, help us turn our hearts to you and hear what you will speak. For you speak peace to your people through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall be, appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eyes shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. The word of the Lord. All right, this morning's gospel reading comes to us from Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 20. Um, much like Jim read, listen for two or three to show up a lot in today's um, sermon. It's really important. Here, actually, let's pray first. Lord, as we come into your presence today to hear your word proclaimed and preached, I pray that you would soften our hearts by the power of your spirit and your truth to hear and to listen to you. Lord, often... Jesus gives us words of assurance, like we heard earlier, but often his teachings are quite confrontational. And I, I think in many ways, in a, in a good and positive sense, that is how today's sermon is, is geared. So Lord, uh, help us to sit under your son's teaching, our new and greater Moses. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. If your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. And then finally, our sermon text today is Exodus 20:16, which is, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The word of the Lord. All right, so as we're slowly 
making our way, so to speak, through the Ten Commandments, today we find ourselves in commandment number nine. Now, as a child, was thou shall not lie yeah that's correct um, the text originally says thou shall not bear false witness against your neighbor but it does expand uh, much further and even to lying um, so your grandmother and your mother catechized you quite well and I know some of you are actually here who catechized your children quite well in God's ways now if we want to walk in the Lord's ways which we should want here at Christ Presbyterian Church um, we need to understand that we keep God's commands through the power of the Spirit. Um, and as we keep God's command through the power of the Spirit, we follow the one who said, I am the way, the and the life. What is commandment number nine all about? Commandment number nine is all about truth with the capital T. Truth matters to God. Um, and as you wade into life and you have conflicts against your neighbor, whether in the context of church or ancient Israel or in the general public, does truth really Courts assume in life that we have a bunch of truth tellers walking all over the place. That may or may not be the case, kind of tongue in cheek, right? Now, if one comes under, uh, if they're summoned by the court to give testimony, they witness something happen, say somebody steals something or somebody hurt another person, what are they supposed to do? They are supposed to swear under oath and they are told to tell the whole truth nothing but the truth, so help me God. Which I actually think all of this, you know, as I was gauging in commandment nine, our whole Western tradition really assumes a lot of scriptural principles here. So here's the problem for us this morning. As I keep recalling or calling our attention to, we live in this age of autonomy and everybody does what is right in their own eyes. So I get that from the book of Judges. And thus we live in this kind of post-truth world. Uh, this especially plays itself out in the political arena. Both political parties, Republicans de and Democrats, break the Ninth Commandment like all the time. This is why I couldn't in good conscience be go into politics. So um, just saying it would be hard. Even when uh, a politician is confronted about a lie, uh, whether it's a big lie or a don't lie period. I'm with Augustine. I'm an absolutist here. Don't lie at all. But often, what do they say? It was just a little white lie. What's the big deal? And is a white lie a big deal? Absolutely, it distorts truth. So our Lord was a truth teller. His preaching style was often not the easiest to swallow. Um, we could even call his truth telling rather confrontational. We're sinners, we don't like the truth. The truth stings. The truth tells us who we really are apart from God's glorious grace. Um, if Jesus wasn't confrontational as a truth teller, would he have ever been publicly crucified in the first place? No, he wouldn't have been. Uh, if you're going around affirming people where they are all the time and not summoning them to a life of redemption, I think everybody's going to like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. But here is our Lord, the truth teller, summoning both the social outcast in his day and the religious establishment to repent. Any person who doesn't see this in our Lord's teaching in Holy Scripture ends up just constructing an, their own Jesus and their own image, which is actually a violation of commandment number one. Um, I, I know many of you, I've said this before from the pulpit and in teaching, Albert Schweitzer, um, a lot of young people won't know who he is. A lot of old people, oh, sorry, I said old, I sound so bad. I just violated, thou shalt honor your mother and father. I am so sorry. I didn't mean that to come out that way. <laughs> uh, Albert Schweitzer, he's this famous uh, Jesus scholar, and he often said when he would read people when they wrote about our Lord, um, the illustration he used is, it was like reading about somebody going into the bathroom, looking at the mirror, and who do you see in the mirror? Yourself. 
And he said, when you're studying our Lord or studying the scriptures, make sure you're not constructing Jesus in your own image. That was like Bible study 101. It's so helpful. It stuck with me for many years. So don't construct Jesus in your own image. He is, in fact, a truth teller. So before we jump into commandment number nine, I also want to just draw to our attention that commandment number nine pairs really, really well with commandment number three. Uh, when I preached on commandment number three, I opted for a broader idea as well. Um, don't misuse or misrepresent the name of the Lord. God's name carries a lot of weight. And it's the same thing with words again this morning. Thou shall not bear false witness against one's neighbor. And I think we can expand that further out to thou shall not lie. Um, I also want to affirm as we work through commandment number nine, as I keep saying every week, this is a commandment from a particular God uh, to a particular people for a particular purpose. Uh, and the purpose for Israel in her context was to make her a holy nation, to set her apart so that she could bear witness to another reality. Does that vocation end with Israel? No, it doesn't. It continues with the church as well. So we are to be holy and set apart, uh, even if we fail miserably. You can't total, I'm not affirming perfectionism this morning. Don't hear me saying that in our, our sermon series, but I also think the spirit can do some mighty work and transform us. So the person you were, say a decade or two ago, not the person you are today, right? I see a lot of head nods, so we're on the same page. All right, so let's turn to Exodus 20, verse 16. All right, the commandment, much like the ones we've been going through up until when we finish next week, is kind of just straightforward. It's a negative command. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Um, this is addressed to individuals in the context of a covenant community, so ancient Israel, and it should ring uh, in our ears and in our minds today, the, the basic fact of this is in the court of law. So the Ten Commandments are important because they uphold God's justice and his truth. So the word witness is key here in this commandment. And this commandment literally shows up everywhere in the Old Testament. It's not just isolated in, uh, in the book of Exodus, um, but it shows up everywhere. So Jim read uh, an example of that. I have another example to read from Numbers 3530. Uh, if anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on the evidence of witness, but no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness, which contradicts two or three. Hopefully you heard two or three a lot today. You can't, in the court of law, have two people talking against each other. Um, it's just he said versus she said. It's very important that you have two or three witnesses to establish truth. All right, Deuteronomy 19.5 says this, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. Now, as I read Matthew chapter 18, did you hear the word two or three a lot? Yeah, hopefully you did. I was trying to emphasize that. This shows that there's a lot more continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament than we often presume. That idea of establishing two witnesses who are truth tellers, who are not lying in the court of law, is so important. Now, I say this all, you might, and a lot of this stuff might sound really harsh in the Old Testament, right? Um, anybody kind of, it sounds really, um, you just don't hear this in popular culture, the seriousness of truth telling, or at least I don't think that you do. Um, and we also live in this weird world where CSI came into existence in the early 2000s, right? That kind of swept everybody up. Now I'm dating myself again. Who's the old person? The pastor is the old person. CSI is like 20 years old. Uh, but in this modern world that we have, you convict people on scientific evidence, right? Uh, if you're on jury duty, what is the number one thing that a jury's looking for? Scientific evidence to establish this is truthful. Now, in the ancient world, which I guess is before, say, like 1970 or 1960s, people went to jail all the time because you had two or three witnesses that could establish something that truthfully happened. And I want to propose to you this morning that the reason why God's laws in the Old Testament in particular are so harsh 
is because truth was really on the line. Um, and somebody probably doesn't like harsh uh, laws on the book until they're falsely accused. And it's really important that you get two or three witnesses to establish truth. Now to share a, a, a slightly funny story, um, at my last congregation in Erie, Pennsylvania, I had a dear uh, elder who was, a, who was a lawyer. He was finishing up his career. Um, for those who like the show uh, Better Call Saul, right? I know that some of us, he has on the back, he was an injury lawyer, so he's just like Saul Goodman. It has lawyer up, and I found a candy bar that said that one day, and I gave it to him as a gift. So I thought it was pretty, pretty great. Uh, but Bob, would, we would talk about this in commandment number nine, and it'd often say, well, you can convict people when you have two or three, four or five witnesses. And he said, you're speaking my language because we used to do this all the time. And he's like, unfortunately now as a lawyer, as an officer of the court, you always got to have CSI evidence. And he said, every time you go to jury duty and you say you can convict somebody with two or three eyewitness testimonies, you're never going to be picked. <laughs> I said, well, maybe that's a good thing, I guess. I don't really necessarily want to be on jury duty. But I just want to reinforce the idea that in ancient Israel, if you lied under oath, it was a serious offense from the Lord, so serious that you would actually receive the same penalty for the person uh, if you're, say, covering for your buddy or whatever. You would actually be in trouble just as much as them. All right, so the commandment doesn't just stop with the courts. Um, it can be more expansive. We can expand it, as Martin Luther, I think, quite, quite, um, he convinced me this week that you can expand it out and argue against uh, prohibitions between betrayal of one's friend, slander, and spreading evil rumors, which sounds a lot like high school, so to speak there, right? Uh, and that's kind of what social media is just kind of devolved in. Uh, social media is not the problem. People that use it for the wrong ends is the problem. Um, so we can expand it out further. Now, all of this is done in the context of, or we might ask the question, why is commandment nine so important for ancient Israel and for us today? And I think it's really important because the reputation of your neighbor was so very important. The reputation of the Israelites was very important as well. Um, all those reputations within the community were really important because God's vocation and calling upon Israel was to be his witnesses to all the ends of, ends of the earth. And was Israel to be different than the nations? Absolutely. But as you read throughout the Old Testament on and on and you get to the times of, of the prophets, was Israel any different than the nations? No, not, not at all. All right, so that was then. Uh, we're here now, we're on this side of redemption, so we have the gospel, we have the power of the Spirit, and you might be asking the question, what do we do with commandment number three in the world that we live in? Now, I first want to address something that I thought about a lot in commandment number nine. What's so bad about telling a lie? What's so bad about slandering, which I think is, is uh, intentionally trying to hurt someone's reputation in the public sphere? Uh, what's so bad about gossiping? Uh, whenever we do those things, we suppress the Spirit's work in our lives, which means that the inner teacher, the Holy Spirit, uh, his voice becomes more and more muddled. So whenever you are tempted to lie or not tell the truth, what usually happens to you at that moment? Alarm bells should be going off in your head, right? Um, before you're about to do something, quote, bad, or even tell a white lie. The Holy Spirit's speaking to you. He's telling you, do not do this. Do not distort the truth. And if you give in to the temptation, I think in many ways the chastisement, I'm going to use that word, from the Spirit, is that we lose the presence of the Spirit in our lives. The more and more uh, untruth that we tell to others, we just lose the ability to actually tell truth in the first place. Um, I've only met a handful of pathological liars in my life. Maybe you've met more, and I will not disclose who they are. Uh, so I'm not, this is not the, bullet, the, the bully uh, pulpit this morning. But, but in many ways, um, the judgment upon them is they just can't tell the truth anymore. Everything that comes out of their mouth, they, you cannot trust the words that come out of their mouth. Um, and so I see people kind of nodding their heads, so you kind of know what, you're, you're, what I'm talking about. 
Now, just to reinforce how serious uh, lying is in the New Testament, I want to read Revelation 21, 8. And this is about judgment as well. And this comes from the, the mouth of our Lord. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, so we've addressed murder before, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all the liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, what group stands out to you in a free speech world that you're like, wow, that is a lot? It's liars. I, I was listening to a podcast this past week about Revelation, and this guy was reading this passage, and everything else is like, yeah, I was taught that by my mother and my grandmother about what scripture says, but the word liar really jumped out to me, right? I think it's because in many ways in the world we live in, we're kind of comfortable in many ways, uh, tragically, with people not telling the truth. We live in this world where everybody does what is right in their own eyes. Now, I purposely left out Revelation 21.7, which is a little bit more cheerful uh, to us this morning. Uh, so I did that on purpose. So I was kind of cherry picking. But I just want to reinforce lying is a big deal. We should not do it. But John uh, records, the one who conquers will have his heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. And that's kind of what I'm trying to get at this morning. The seriousness of sin is still with us, but we're also to conquer and overcome sin as well. And the one who allows us to do that is the Holy Spirit. So if you are a gossiper or a slanderer or a liar, um, there's good news for you. God can redeem your words and your speech, and he can totally transform you. Um, I say this because, you know, all of the commandments, there are certain commandments we might naturally live by, and there are certain ones that we might not. And so I don't know where your heart is this morning. Commandment number nine, uh, a suppression of the truth might be something that's really difficult for you. I don't know. All right, so I want to ask the question, what is the Lord doing with this commandment? So we've gone through all the, quote, bad stuff, the seriousness of sin. Um, what kind of world and redemptive world is God calling into existence through our church community here? That's what I really want to try to ask. So throughout the series, we've talked about the seriousness of sin, right, and violation of God's law, but we've always talked about the opposite, um, God's transforming work in our life. That's kind of where I think preachers go sideways sometimes. They'll beat you up, you're ma masochistic, so to speak. You're, everybody knows that all have sinned and fallen short of glory of God, right? But is God an amazing God that can redeem and transform us as well and change our lives? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm really trying to get at that with commandment number nine as well. So this is where the larger catechism uh, is really helpful. And I wanna read question 144 in the answer and just take some time to listen carefully because I could just read this and stop here because they do such a great job at uh, highlighting the positive effect of walking in God's ways and loving one's neighbor. But I won't do that. I have some other ideas that I want to share this morning as well. But they do such a great job, so it's really worth reading and not just mentioning. Because if I tell you to go read 144, you're all probably going to forget. I, I know that, so I'm going to read it. All right, the ninth commandment requires... Oh, I'm sorry, question. What does the ninth commandment require? The answer is, the ninth commandment requires that we maintain and promote truthfulness in our own dealings with each other and good reputation of others as well as ourselves. We must come forward and stand up for the truth, speaking the truth and nothing but the truth from our hearts, sincerely, freely, and without equivocation, not only in all matters relating to the law and justice, but in any and every circumstance whatsoever. Ever. We must have charitable regard for others, loving, desiring, and rejoicing in their good reputation, as well as regretting and putting the best light in their failings. We must freely acknowledge their talents and gifts, defending their innocence, readily receiving a good report about them, and reluctantly admitting a bad one. We should discourage gossips, flatterers, and slanderers. We should love and protect our own good reputation and defend it when necessary. We should love every lawful promise we make no matter what. I'm sorry, that should read, we should keep. 
And finally, we should do the best we can to focus our lives and thoughts on things that are true, noble, lovely, and admirable. And that is a great passage because it's not just so simple, that commandment number nine. You just abide by it. It, it's, it stretches really far. And what I love about question and answer 144 is that it just shows how far this commandment stretches in terms of what the Lord can do. Um, does the commandment say that Christians can be perfected in this age? No, but it also assumes that the Spirit can do some amazing work in people's lives as well. So what I want to do is tease this out in three quick ways, and this is kind of wisdom. Um, being, being a pastor for a while, these are kind of three ways that I'd like to engage with commandment number nine that can help us understand it well. So the first one <clears throat> is pretty straightforward. Don't bear false witness against God and his word. So I'm going to take it in uh, relation to God. Number two, I'm going to relate it to our neighbor. So what do you do when you're tempted to violate commandment number nine? And then finally, number three, how to deal with false accusations. I love how the larger catechism said, there are going to be people that are going to falsely accuse you in life. Has everybody had this experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So we want to engage with that as well. It's really, really important. All right, number one, don't bear false witness against God and his word. So we don't want to do that as Christians. We don't want to twist God's words uh, in Holy Scripture and bend them towards our will. This view lines up really well with commandment number three about misrepresenting the name of the Lord. This was Israel's vocation and calling, and it was placed upon Adam and Eve as well. So they are really important. And so we're going to stretch all the way back to Adam and Eve because there's a violation of commandment nine in, that, in Genesis 3. So when Adam and Eve fell, they broke all 10 commandments. You can actually read through it. I'm, I'm not going to do that every week, but you can see how they break every commandment. Uh, and you can just tick through them. What's really fascinating as you engage with Adam and Eve is their fall and their sin patterns become a paradigm for Israel as well. And you can actually see this explicitly in the Golden Calf episode, which we went over in commandment number one. God saves and rescues Israel, and what is she doing? She's making a false idol, right? And worshiping, incorrect worship. I wanna put before us this morning that a lot of sins in our life are, are the result of word twisting. And so I just wanna tick through Adam and Eve quite quickly. So in the fall, what does the serpent say to Eve? Did God actually say, you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? Does the serpent talk correctly there, or does he twist words? He twists words. What is he doing? He's bearing false witness against God, I believe. This is perhaps why John calls the devil the father of all lies, I think, um, and engages quite well with commandment number nine. Eve buys into the serpent, misrepresenting the Lord in his lies. And is Adam alone? No. Um, I think, along with most commentators, would argue that Adam is there the whole entire time, and he's seeing the whole entire thing play out. And does he love his neighbor as himself, Eve, and protect her from the serpent and his cunning words? No. And what happens in this court, it's a court scene, actually, I think, Genesis 3, because you have God as judge descending to talk to all three parties. He first addressed Adam. And what does Adam say, essentially, in 3.12? He says, basically, Eve made me do it. So he's pointing, and he's bearing false witness against his neighbor. What does Eve do? She points the opposite direction and blames the serpent. We don't really get it into the logic of the serpent, but I'm thinking the serpent probably said, those dumb humans, they, they didn't understand me properly too. You get all of this finger pointing going on. Um, fallen angel, Adam, and Eve, all in the court of law are bearing false witness against one another. And the sad thing is as you get to the Cain and Abel story, this plays out as well. Uh, what is the phrase, the famous phrase in that one? Am I my brother's keeper, right? So if we find ourselves in a position like Adam and Eve, what do we do? You just don't twist God's words. Don't twist your neighbor's words. 
don't quote scripture out of context for your own gain. I'm just going to throw that one in there because that bothers me, honestly, when people just throw out a random verse and don't really think about it. Don't twist God's words. I think it could expand there. Um, because words have a lot of power and we should take them quite seriously. All right, so that's our relationship with God. Now I want to wade into our relationship with our neighbor. So one easy out, in my, my view, from maybe bearing false witness against your neighbor is, and this is just more of an experience from life, is don't assume the worst in your neighbor. So if someone says, and I'm using myself as an example here, I'm bad at this. If someone says to me, I need to have coffee with you to talk about something in three days, and they don't tell me what they're going to talk about, does that make you nervous? Some of you makes you nervous. Maybe some of you are like, eh, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, but in that instance, and you can relate this to whatever area of your life you struggle in, what does our mind start to do? We start to fill in all these gaps. And are they often positive? No, they're often negative. And what we find ourselves doing is escalating the situation. I'm pretty convinced this is where gossip starts to come in, which kind of has this secretive element. You might say to your, your neighbor, maybe you're not, it's good to have a friend that you can just speak frankly with and share everything with. It's not good to have like 10 of those. That's gossip. If you can speak to one person in confidence and they could tell you, no, you're really off base here. You want somebody like that. Um, but that's where gossip starts to come in. So-and-so told me to meet and could you help me figure out what they're talking about? Because I can't. And before you know it, you've told 20 people. Or in the church context, the whole church knows that this meeting's going to happen. And everybody wants to know what's going to happen. But everybody's trying to hide it. They don't know. Uh, or worse, this gossip can then escalate even further up to slander. And you could look to diminish your neighbor's credibility or their character. Commandment number nine deals with all of these particular issues. Now, in our modern world, we often call this triangulation. This is what psychologists and counselors call it, where you take another party and you want to use them to get at the other person. Um, I'm just simply here to say this morning, don't do that. When you got a problem with somebody, just go, with, go to them directly and talk to them. Um, don't share it with somebody else. Don't do that. Now, if you find yourself in a space where you're tempted to violate this commandment, I used one such example, there might be many other, uh, seek the wisdom of Scripture and the Westminster Longer Catechism. I think it does a great job at teaching and instructing us what to do. Uh, rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to promote truthfulness with your speech, even if you don't like that person, especially if you don't like that person. Um, take the, the position that, there's something wrong with me, not them, why I don't like them. I think that's great. It's gotten me really far in life, I think. Um, by the power of the Holy Spirit, always be charitable to your neighbor and their good reputation. That's really important. By the power of the Holy Spirit, discourage others from gossip and slander. And you might get in your, yourself in trouble along the way when you're a hard truth teller. To, when you tell your friend, would you please just stop talking about so-and-so, right? By the power of the Spirit, keep your promises. That's really important, too. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, when necessary, protect your own reputation. I think that that's an important part of today's message as well. There's a reason why we still have liable laws uh, in the United States. Can you just go around and tell damage people's character in the United States? No. Um, I used to listen to... I've mentioned podcast a few times. There's this podcast that I would listen to, and he was a trained lawyer, really smart guy, and he would refrain from saying something. He's like, I'm afraid I'm going to get sued in the court of law. And he said it kind of tongue-in-cheek, but it got me thinking, we still have these laws on, on the books. You can't just go around and slander your neighbor, right? In everything we do as Christians through the Holy Spirit, we should have lives dedicated to truth, nobility, um, pursuing that which is lovely, and we should be admirable by our neighbors. So that includes both the people we love and can get along quite well with and the people that drive us nuts sometimes. So that's a real practical thing. We all have people in our lives that drive us nuts. I can affirm that. All right, so you've been going along today, and you might be like, I don't really struggle with gossip or slander or whatnot. Um, I might be a little bit skeptical towards you. But you might be thinking along the lines of, well, what happens to me when I'm the one 
uh, that's being falsely accused of something, right? Everybody has experienced this in their life, and our Lord experienced this as well. Um, that's why we have Matthew 18, 15 through 20, and it's a kind of uh, Christ-centered approach to how to deal with false testimony. So if a person says something in the context of church against you that's not true, what are we supposed to do? Speak to them directly and say, please, would you stop doing that? That's not a true testimony against my character. Um, and if they continue to do it, what do you do next? You bring another Christian friend with you and you confront the person again. Um, everybody has probably experienced it. If you've been in church for a, a decade or more or whatnot, I'm sure everybody has experienced this. Number three, if that person doesn't listen, who do you speak to next? In our polity, I would say you speak to an elder. Um, session meets once a month, and session is actually a court of law, uh, or book of order. I had to know this for ordination. Uh, there are three courts in the e Evangelical Presbyterian Church. There's the session, the presbytery, and the General Assembly. Um, one benefit, so I'm kind of pitching the new, new members class in August this morning, one benefit of being a member of a church is that your session will protect your good reputation. Um, and if someone is saying bad things about you, session will get involved in a loving way. I mean, we don't just like discipline people left and right. There's some Reformed Christians that do that. Um, we always want to handle things in private first. Um, that's one of the distinct things about the EPC. But we take these things quite seriously. Uh, and if you are not a member of the local church, we don't really have, the session doesn't have jurisdiction in how to deal with it. It makes things a little bit more complicated. So I would say it's pretty applicable because in the New Testament, we have a passage that assumes a lot of this in Matthew 18. Uh, that's why it says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. That's assumed in the context of a court not necessarily Bible study. Has everybody heard where two or three are gathered there and with you used for Bible study? That's true, you can proof text that, but the passage itself is actually talking about a serious nature of where, where a brother has sinned against another brother or sister and so forth. All right, so this morning has been one long sermon about being careful with your words, essentially. Now, I wanna end on a positive and redemptive note. Uh, Christians can be people who have been redeemed and their mouths uh, can be redeemed. Uh, that's easier said than done, right? But be aware, uh, as a Christian, if you tell the truth consistently in life, and I'm kind of stealing this from one commentator on, on commandment number nine, he said, you will create conflict. Jesus, as a truth teller, did he create conflict when he summoned people to to think about sin and, and the gospel? Absolutely. If you shared the gospel with a friend, a family member, or someone just, the Lord just says, go share the gospel with this person on the street, does it usually go in the direction of conflict? Yeah, absolutely. Um, conflict's going to happen in life, but you are also called to be a peacemaker. So you share the truth of the gospel, there's a conflict that arises, and then through the power of the Spirit, you are a peacemaker. And so my prayer for our congregation throughout this week as we engage commandment number nine is we would be a congregation filled with people who love the truth and we'd also be a congregation that as conflict arises, as we tell the truth to people, what do we do? We're peacemakers. So go and be peacemakers this week and forevermore. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for commandment number nine. Uh, even as I engaged with this commandment this week, it's more expansive and perhaps harder than, than I thought. Um, Lord, help us to be a congregation that puts sin to death, uh, the sin of not telling the truth, the sin of lying and gossiping and slander, uh, but also help us to be a congregation where if someone does hurt us with their words, that we are quick to forgive our neighbor. In many ways, that's what is the only thing that makes us different than the world. We forgive others as you have forgiven us. Lord, help us to understand the power of your spirit in our lives. Uh, help us to understand that we are new creatures, 
that we are temples of your spirit and you can truly transform us in radical ways. So Lord, help us to understand that power and help us to be truth tellers. And as we tell the truth, Lord, help us to be peacemakers as well. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, if you would stand and we will sing our last song. Before I give the benediction, I do want to apologize for that joke I said about elderly. I didn't mean it to come out that way. Um, last night at 5 o'clock, Ezra woke up and started throwing up all over the place. So when I was on my ride this morning, I was like, Lord, please help me because my mind's not in the right place. So I'm going to blame it on my tiredness, but I'm sincerely sorry if that came out the wrong way. So, all right, please forgive me. <laughs> all right, now here, uh, blessing and benediction from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said? Amen. And now Michael, our music and outreach director, is going to give our uh, dismissal this morning. All right. Christ Presbyterian Church, what is your mission? We go forth in the power of the Spirit to serve God's world as the head, heart, and hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go Amen. And be peacemakers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>